of the seven part video series on expected trade loss model. I'm Jatin Kalra, director in Grant Thornton Bharat CFO Services uh, team and today we are going to talk about what makes a good ECR model good. Why is it that some models and results that come out of it seem to make sense but then there are others which would give very puzzling results. Experience tells us that it's all in the design. How ECL looks at an entity's portfolio is in sync with how the management looks at it. Chances are the results would intuitively feel more reasonable. And hence, how we segment the portfolio into pools for ECL calculation purpose is extremely important. Let's first look at what the standard says about segmentation. IFRS 9 states that depending on the diversity of its customer base, the entity will use appropriate groupings if its historical credit loss experience shows significantly different loss patterns for different customer segments. Examples of criteria that might be used to group assets include geographical region, product type, customer rating, collateral, or trade credit insurance, and type of customer such as wholesale rating. So it's clear that we can break up our loan book in the manner that makes sense from a credit risk perspective. Break it up such that the pools that come out of it have shared credit risk characteristics. But what's the process and what kind of techniques can be used to identify what is right for your portfolio? Well, generally, you start with any segmentation used for underwriting or risk management purposes. If there are products which have differing underwriting or policy, uh, pricing policy, then that generally would always qualify as separate segments. So a retail lending company that has housing loans and also auto loans would likely consider these two separately for ECL modeling purpose. For more matured businesses, one generally expects a risk rating or a credit scoring based approach. It may be internal scale or external or a combination of the two. Based on algorithms, customers and loans are stratified into buckets based on their credit risk. Anything between 6 to 10 rating or score bands are commonly used. Two important considerations while using this approach is one, ensuring that the credit scoring models are regularly tested and validated. And second, that the triggers are identified for when individual loans should move from one level to another. In comparison to other segmentation strategies, movement between pools is most common in this one. If the entity does not have a robust risk rating or credit scoring model, or maybe it has some data challenges, then there are other popular ways of segmenting like based on collateral type, size, geographical location, especially when you're, you, know, you have customers in multiple countries, uh, industry of the borrower and vintage. Noted that it's sometimes important to aggregate pools which are individually immaterial or lack the data on their own for credit risk modeling purpose. Now there are various statistical tests that should be used to determine whether the pools which are thus created respond similarly to different scenarios and whether they are adequately differentiated from other pools. While pools which are used for ECL calculation are not static, but changes in the pool structure should only be made if it's because of underlying changes in some circumstances. Constant tinkering with ECL model is not ideal. Now let's talk about staging. As most of you would know, IFRS 9 has a three-stage ECL model. Stage 1 is where all loans would start and provisions are measured for loss events which are expected in the next 12 months only. Stage 2 is where they would go if credit risk has increased significantly post origination and provisions are then measured for loss events which are expected in the entire lifetime of the loan. Stage 3 is where the exposures which have defaulted would fall under. We still make provisions for entire lifetime but the provision amount is netted off from the loan amount and any interest income is also recognized only on the net balance. Therefore, as can be expected, 
any movement from stage 1 to stage 2 would result in a significant spike in provisions. Let's imagine a thousand dollar loan which has five years on it and one person loss rate per annum. If in stage 1 the ECL provision would be ten dollars which is one percent on a thousand dollar loan. If however it was in stage 2 you need to create provision for entire 5 years which it has remaining. So that 1% per annum for 5 years gives you 5%. 5% $1000 give you $50. Which is a 5 time increase from the provision which you had in stage 1. Now this is an overly simplified example which assumes a flat PD curve and that the exposure amount would remain the same in the entire 5 years which are you know generally not expected in practice. Um, but the key point here is that a downgrade from stage 1 to stage 2 would result in massive increase in provisions and hence what are considered as triggers for significant increase in credit risk and triggers for movement from stage 1 to 2 requires careful consideration. The standard provides a rebuttable presumption wherein any exposure which is 30 days past due should be moved to stage 2. However, most entities are expected to have some additional early warning signals also that can help track movement in credit risk on a real-time basis. These generally mean including pre-deliquency behavioral indicators like the utilization on credit limits or stress on borrower's capability to repay due to business performance or economic circumstances. For example, a loan which is given to a real estate company might need to be downgraded to stage 2 if for example let's say there are delays in construction which is causing stress on liquidity and cash flow. Similarly, a cruise liner right, that is struggling on capacity metrics because of changing consumer behavior might need to be downgraded to stage 2. A common practice also is to include all modified and restructured loans into either stage 2 or stage 3. So with this discussion on segmentation and staging, we would have realized that this area requires a lot of judgment. But how well these are addressed would determine whether the ECL models which you create follows business logic or does it result in very unexplained, unreasonable kind of volatility. Hope you found this session useful. Thanks and see you in the next one.